Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on Archaeological Heritage Projects. This is the fourth and last webinar in our Heritage Webinar series. I am Kim Kluche, Assistant Director of Archaeology and Heritage Management with the Heritage Conservation Branch at the Ministry of Parks, Culture and Sport. To begin, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that Regina, where our office is located, is in Treaty 4 territory, traditional lands of the Cree, Nakota, Dakota, Lakota, and Anishinaabe, and homeland of the Métis. The previous webinar presentations have showcased historic places with connections to tourism, business development, and community engagement. Today's webinar, although focusing on archaeological heritage projects, touch upon and interweave many of those same themes of tourism, business, and community. Before starting, I would like to remind everyone to keep your microphones and cameras turned off during the presentations. I'll ask that you hold your questions until after both presentations have finished. You can also use the chat for questions and we'll do our best to get to them. For our first presentation today, we'll hear about the technology of ground penetrating radar or GPR and how it can be used and applied to help communities, rural municipalities and church groups identify unmarked graves in their cemeteries. To tell us about how cemetery management is crucial to preserving history, commemorating ancestors and planning for future cemetery use is Mike Markowski, Director and Principal Archaeologist of Adel Heritage Services Corporation. Mike completed his bachelor's degree and master's degree in archaeology at the University of Saskatchewan. He's been working in the consulting industry for 15 years and co-founded Adel Heritage in 2014. Mike has extensive experience completing heritage resource impact assessments across the prairies and has worked in every corner of Saskatchewan. The results of Mike's work has resulted in the recording of several new archaeological sites, a provincial heritage site designation, avoidance of traditional sites, and re recognition and protection of traditionally used areas. With a keen interest in history, Mike turned to cemeteries and ground penetrating radar. Mike furthered his training with GPR and has completed several cemetery management projects and is often contracted to identify unmarked graves or reported graves. Mike, you can go ahead and start your presentation. Thanks, Kim. Can, every, can you hear me good here? I can. Okay, perfect. All right. Uh, I'm going to run through this presentation here pretty quick. Um, there's a bit of uh, uh, writing on the on each slide, so I'm not going to read through each one. Um, it's just added information if if you guys want to follow along there. Um, so first off, I'm going to just just a brief outline here. Uh, I'm going to talk about um, how a GPR works. Um, I find in a lot of cases um, and we hear about GPR a lot in the news and the media lately. Um, but a lot of us do not understand how it works and and how it's used and how to interpret it and whatnot. And then I'll um, get into applications in archaeology, uh, cemetery management, and then just uh, I'll end with a quick uh, case study on the Shiloh Baptist Church and Cemetery. So GPR um, consists of three main components. Uh, there's a console an antenna and an encoder. Um, the console um, is kind of the brains of the system. It's it's like it's also known as a, a digital video logger. Um, the antenna is where the GPR signal is produced um, and that's on the bottom. Um, you'll see in the next slide here and the encoder is commonly referred to as a survey wheel which controls the locational accuracy of the GPR data. Um, additional components that are extremely valuable to the GPR user is an external GPS um, and that helps um, with accuracy. So here's a GPR. Um, this is out at Fort Carlton. Um, we have the console here. It's just it's basically a, a computer screen um, that reads as we go. It's so it's a live reading. Um, the encoder is down by the wheel. Um, the antenna is on the bottom and the GPS is up here. So the, the antenna, um, the in general, the higher the GPR antenna frequency is um, equal to the greater resolution, but less depth penetration. 
Uh, lower frequency systems have diminished resolution, but greater depth penetration. Um, and there's a whole range of uh, antenna for GPR for all kinds of different purposes for, you know, whether it's looking for rebar and cement or, or um, again, for, or for archaeological purposes. Um, in general, though, for archaeological purposes, um, there's um, usually three main types of antenna that are used. There's a 250 megahertz antenna, which is good for around three meters to five meters in depth. There's a 500 megahertz antenna, which is uh, good for the uh, one meter to two meters in depth. And for maximum depths up to 10 meters, um, there's 100 megahertz antennas. Um, there's several key factors to consider when doing a GPR survey. Um, and it primarily centers around the, the electrical the electrical connectivity of the soil. So um, sand and gravel soils have uh, optimal resolution and you can see greater depths. Um, clay soils act, um, restrict resolution and depths. So that poses a problem um, throughout much of the prairies here. Uh, the GPR antenna produces an electromagnetic pulse at the ground surface. Um, and this pulse forms a wave. Um, it travels into the subsurface and will continue into the subsurface until one of two things happen. Either the signal strength totally decays, so it, be, it disappears, or it will hit an object and bounce back. And this is, this is where it comes into our use for, for archaeological purposes. Um, so when it bounces back, it forms a, a, a hyperbole, and uh, so it, it kind of looks like this. Uh, this is just a quick demonstration. So the first on the left, you have the radar waves going into the ground, and if it hits an object, it bounces back, and you get the inverted uh, hyperbole, and then and then once you pass it, you keep going, and then um, it, it just it resumes back to the normal um, waves going down. GPR surveys are completed by using survey methodology on um, several factors, is based on several factors. So you could do a grid scan, um, and that's where you go on X, Y lines. So that's like 100% um, coverage of an area. That's basically if you're looking for a buried object and you have no idea of its orientation. Uh, line scan, uh, single lines are scanned parallel to each other. So often in a marked cemetery, um, graves are oriented, um, you know, east, west, or sometimes even north, south. Um, so you know which way um, you're going to do your GPR survey to intersect um, the grave to see the feature. And there's also a pseudo, pseudo grid data, um, which um, requires an external GPS. And this is kind of just a freestyle survey where you can just kind of go all over. Um, it's it's used more so for um, utility locating, line locates, and stuff like that. Uh, GPR data is viewed on the console. Um, however, it's all I always recommend, um, especially again on the prairies, being that we have a heavy clay content soil, um, to further process the data through specialized GPR programs. So here's just a quick shot of the console. Um, I, if you guys could see on the, there's a purple dot here. Um, that's a, a, a marked grave, what it looks like. And then it went back to normal. And then the blue dot is on an unmarked grave, just to give you an idea. And this is what some of the data will look like. Um, so the, on the, the image on the right has um, seven unmarked graves. Um, and that's that's the yellow dots around the top of each grave. So you could really see the hyperbole that it produced um, once it hit a solid object. Um, and so these graves, I mean, this is just running through us echo project software. These graves we know are approximately 0.35 to 0.45 meters below the surface. So applications for archaeology. Um, GPR has been used in archaeology for decades and is an important tool for non-invasive mapping. Um, it's, GPR has not commonly been used on the prairies up until the 2000s or so. Um, factors 
in this um, is the predominant clay soils, costs of the equipment and the programs, and just a general lack of educational opportunities. In recent years, there's been um, several game changers. Um, one being costs. I mean, it's still a costly piece of equipment. I am um, one GPR such as the one in the in the photo with Fort Carlton there. That's worth pro approximately like thirty thousand um, dollars, but they have decreased. Um, there's increased training opportunities. Um, there's several companies out there that provide training and um, the programs have have uh, they're a lot more user friendly to use. However, they do require um, a bit of uh, there's a steep learning curve and, and a bit of training involved there. Um, GPR allows the archaeologists to rap rapidly acquire data on the positions of archaeological features across entire sites. So inferences about the spatial layout of a site can be made to minimize disturbance during exploratory mapping. So for in archaeology, here's just some examples of how GPR can be used on historic sites. Um, it's great for, you know, finding buried foundations, cellar depressions, privies, buried features, pits, uh, measuring depths and size of buried features, artifact concentrations. Now, um, it, GPR has been used on pre-contact period sites, but um, it, it's it's debatable how great it is from the results for pre-contact period sites. Um, I'm referring definitely to historic uh, sites with the artifact concentrations comment there. Um, it's all, GPR has also been used to relocate old excavation units to develop accurate site provenience from poorly reported excavations, um, forensic investigations, and of course, uh, cemetery mapping, um, which includes identifying unmarked graves, the verification of marked graves, um, and even mass graves um, from epidemics and whatnot. So here's an example of a project we worked on um, this summer. Um, we had a heritage resources impact assessment to do out at Fort Carlton Provincial Park. Um, so prior to um, assessing the, the area in advance of a, of a rental accommodation development, um, we surveyed the area with GPR, um, being that it is um, uh, there's a, obviously a big historical component to the site. Um, we were looking for buried um, foundations and cellar depressions um, to identify to focus our testing. Um, so this is the map of of uh, what we completed out at Fort Carlton. The the yellow outline is our survey area. The purple features are GPR anomalies that we identified during the survey. And we tested the majority of them, if not almost all of them. Um, they were they all proved to be um, the results of metallic artifacts such as nails or just pieces of metal. Um, there was one interesting feature um, towards the northwest corner. There it was round, and, and it looked like a it it looked like a buried um, cellar depression. Um, however, once we started testing. And we soon realized it, there was this, uh, it was, it identified a, a thin, well, a fairly thin gravel lens and further discussion with the, the maintenance crew um, proved that uh, they used to have a gravel pile right here and a little cut across road. So it picked that up. Um, one interesting thing um, for this, uh, prior to our, the heritage assessment here, we did some desktop research and through some old um, photographs, we noted that there was a historic trail coming into the park to the to the fort. Um, so and then during just our visual reconnaissance survey during the HRA, um, we know we could see the, the trail go up the bank here. Um, and then while completing the GPR survey, you could really see the, the extent of the trail through the area because um, it was it, the GPR was picking up the disturbed soils. Um, very rutted up and compact, um, which would have been from wagons and carts and whatnot coming down into the fort. Here's a, just an example from a cemetery um, that we were working on. Uh, it was we were completing the GPR survey, and I noted the the grass had really been um, 
cut down or the more really skim the top of the service here. Um, not knowing what it was at the time, I thought it might be, you know, the some type of building feature was there. Um, all that was there was a rock. Um, and then I, so I, after that, after the GPR survey and processing the data, I, you could see in the top right, there, there's a red outline. You could clearly see that's the the remains of a of a building feature or cellar type depression. Um, I followed up with the client, and it turned out that this was actually where um, they had a uh, a vault where they stored the bodies. If if people died through the winter months, they placed the bodies in this vault, and then in the spring they went and carried on with the traditional burial. So this shows some of the uses of how it can be used. Um, on to cemetery management. Uh, cemeteries are an important part of our history. Um, cemetery management is crucial to preserving our history, commemorating our ancestors, and planning for future internments and cemetery use. Um, unfortunately, many cemeteries have no plans, poor records, and unmarked graves, making internments and management of the cemetery problematic. So from our findings, um, it's rare to find a prairie cemetery that has no unmarked graves. In fact, um, unmarked graves are also found on historic sites um, such as homesteads, archaeological sites, construction activities, residential schools, and et cetera. And so graves in the 1800s and throughout the early 1900s, and even today, um, not all get marked with a, you know, a nice, um, shiny headstone. Um, so graves are often marked with wood crosses and stones. Um, families, you know, over time would, you know, either move away or, you know, this you get further away from that family member. So graves are not always upkept. Um, wood rots and falls down and slowly those marked graves become unmarked with time. Or in a lot of cases, um, this the cemetery guy, the people that are um, maintaining the cemetery cutting grass will move rocks out of the way just to ease the you know grass cutting and and maintenance of the cemetery and and without really realizing that that rock may have represented a, a grave at one time. Another factor, um, certainly with early cemeteries, um, was prairie fires. There are several his oral historical accounts of prairie fires sweeping through cemeteries. Uh, resulting in wood crosses being burned. So again, if if those wood crosses aren't replaced, um, they're probably just often left and then you know deteriorate with time and and then are removed. Um, additional factors. There's a whole range of additional factors. I mean, I from fights with the church to to the cemetery groups to um, you know you know non-baptized children um, being buried in you know certain places of the cemetery and and adults as well and causes of death and and sometimes those people um never received a, an official marker here's an example of a cemetery we worked on this summer um the blue the blue are uh the blue graves are the marked graves the red are the unmarked graves um so as you can see there's certainly a few unmarked graves um if you look in the in the Top right corner, um, there's there there's three marked graves, um, right in the corner. Um, there's also several unmarked graves right around it. And um, from what we know, um, they are um, children's graves. Um, and I would assume, I don't know for sure, were likely unbaptized children at the time, and were buried in the corner of the cemetery. Here's just an example of what some of the data processing looks like. Um, right in the middle, there's four graves um, with the dots. Um, these are, it's these graves in particular are highly reflective. So that suggests that there's a lot of uh, metal or metallic hardware on the coffins. So they really reflect back. You could really see those ones in particular. And, and in other areas, it's a little lighter. Um, here's another map of, uh, of some cemetery work we did. Obviously, there's a couple marked graves with the grave covers. Um, the purple is a marked grave. Um, there's a cross here. You can't really see it on this image. Um, the yellow are all unmarked graves. Um, interestingly enough, um, as you can see, 
um, on most of these in this drone image that mm, the majority of the unmarked graves are associated with the rock at the head of the cemetery, at the head of the grave. So the, you know, the rocks are there. Um, you know, at one time people knew whose graves they were, they were marking a grave, but over time they, they just became unmarked. So now just turning to a little quick case study on the Shiloh Baptist Church and Cemetery. Um, it's a provincial heritage property. Um, in 2018, it was designated as the 53rd Provincial Heritage Property. And this site is located um, northeast of Maidstone, Saskatchewan. Um, I'll just touch on a brief history of Shiloh. Um, in 1907, Oklahoma passed the discriminatory legislation against African Americans which segregated and disenfranchised them under the law. It was then that the African-Americans living in the new state of Oklahoma took notice of a Canadian advertisement placed in the newspaper um, declaring free land for the millions. Um, so many African-Americans left Oklahoma and settled into Western Canada. In the spring of 1910, a small group of 12 fam families founded the African-American uh, settlement um, known as Shiloh, um, led by Julius Caesar Lane and Joseph Mays in the arm of Eldon. Um, by 1911, the families began to build the Shiloh Church. Um, and this is a little side story that in 1913, Julius Caesar Lane was the first person to be buried in the adjacent cemetery to the church. Um, by the 1920s and 30s, as many as 50 Amer African American families were established in the arm of Eldon. Here's an image of the church. Um, this is the original church. However, they have done um, some restoration activities to further preserve um, the church and the Shiloh Cemetery. These are this is the picture of the two pictures. Um, it's split. It almost looks like it's one of the interior of the church. Um, it's very simple and crude, um, but as you could imagine, um, you know, early 1900s. That's that's basically what you'd get. Um, just a little more history here. Um, so the promise of free land and the potential to escape from the discrimination was short lived. In 1911, the government of Canada, um, in an effort to stop African American immigration, stated that any immigrants belonging to the Negro race is deemed unsuitable to the climate and requirements of Canada. In addition, local communities were reluctant to allow African Americans to be buried in their established cemeteries owing to the need to establish their own. By the 1940s, many of the families had dispersed throughout Canada and the church and the cemetery was closed. Um, there's been a few burials since um, with special consideration. Um, this um, from um, the burials were from direct descendants of the Shiloh people. Otherwise, it um, remains as is. So here's an image um, just off the corner of the church. Um, there's a main cemetery area backed by these pines. And then there's another grouping of graves um, in the other corner, which is a more of a family grouping. So in more recent years, descendants of the Shiloh people have formed the Shiloh Baptist Church and Cemetery Restoration Society, um, formed by Leander Lane in 2002. Um, this society has taken on the role of maintaining the Shiloh Church and the cemetery, as well as uncovering the lost past of a courageous group of people in search of a free and peaceful life. After, um, so I, I've always known about this church, um, but I never knew much about the Shiloh people and whatnot. But um, a few years ago, after reading an, a feature article in, um, it was in the Prairie's North magazine about the Shiloh Baptist Church and Cemetery and their ongoing work there, I um, reached out to uh, Mr. Lane um, to offer a service that we specialize in. Every year, um, we try to select a project or a couple projects as a way of giving back or and or to complete some internal research on and or for just educational purposes for our staff. So when I contacted Leander, he informed me that he was actually in the process of writing a book about the Shiloh people. And ironically, he was currently working on a chapter about the Shiloh Cemetery. Um, Leander was thrilled and noted that there that they know of uh, a few unmarked graves within the cemetery based on burial records and oral history. 
Uh, Leander felt finding these graves while mapping the cemetery will add value to the history and to his own research. So in the fall of uh, 2020, we completed a, a GPR survey of portions of the cemetery. Um, we focused on the area, uh, the two marked areas of the cemetery, um, just primarily due to time and oral history. Leander was quite confident that there is no unmarked graves in the in the big open areas. Um, however, I mean that we, that's further research that could be completed. Um, we also focused on around the church um, due to oral history of a grave of a specific grave. Um, I don't have the individual's name, but there is a documentation of this individual being placed in the vicinity of the church um, due to uh, a winter kind of like what we're having now with lots of snow and they could not access the cemetery. So they essentially buried this individual right outside the church. Um, in total, um, there's we mapped 47 marked graves and discovered five unmarked graves. Here's just the next few slides have some photos of the GPR survey. Um, Leander is back standing back here. Um, so we're completing the GPR survey. This is a 250 megahertz um, unit. Uh, and here is uh, we're surveying adjacent to the church area. And here's another shot of the church adjacent to the church. Um, we never realized this when we were doing, when we were completing the work. We did note a subtle depression here, um, but we weren't sure if that was associated with the, an unmarked grave or not. Um, however, there is a rock right here, um, right by Brad Shealy's feet. Um, this is just a map of the cemetery, um, what we completed. The blue uh, represent marked graves, red or unmarked graves. And there is, a, as you can see, there's a unmarked grave adjacent to the church. So here's just uh, some interpretation more so of, our, of around the church area. Um, the church is right above this square. This was the focus area of the GPR survey or the primary area we surveyed. Um, note that small boulder right there that I noted in the other pre in the previous slide. Um, the image to the top right um, shows our line survey. Um, the red portions of the black lines are um, consistent with what we see as a as a feature of for a buried grave. So it was forming the right um, shape and size. Um, the bottom left is a 3D image of the GPR data. Um, again, it, it circled. Um, this is the grave. Um, again, it fits the size of a of an adult grave um, and consistent with everything else in the cemetery and and just from other cemetery research. And so, at the bottom right is basically we were able to confirm that this is indeed um, where the the grave is located, and um, it actually is oriented exactly. Um, like the rest of the graves in the cemetery, including a rock at the foot of the cemetery. Um, is um, Leander was noted here, he noted out at Shiloh that it was custom um, for the for the Shiloh people. I don't know if this is uh, part of, well, obviously part of uh, some type of religious beliefs that um, rocks were placed at the foot of graves. So just a quick summary, um, the GPR survey identified five unmarked graves, um, which adds value to the history and allows these people to be proper, properly commemorated and recognized. Uh, the GPR survey around the church confirmed the oral history of an individual who was buried near the church. Um, again, he was buried near the church due to the, the amount of snow and they were unable to access the, the the cemetery. Um, additional areas were also identified around the church um, that may also consist of additional graves. And lastly, um, Leander is working hard on his book and he's set to have it published um, later this year. Um, so stay tuned for the road to Shiloh. And that is it. All right, thank you very much, Mike, for your presentation and telling us about how GPR functions and the value it holds for archaeology and specifically for cemetery management projects. 
A reminder to everyone that we will take questions at the end of the presentations, and please ensure that your microphones and cameras remain turned off. Our second and final presentation today is about archaeological field schools. These are opportunities for the public and local communities to gain some hands-on experience with history. The Saskatchewan Archaeological Society has been offering public field schools for decades and recently partnered with Saskatchewan Parks and the University of Saskatchewan to develop the Fort Carleton Archaeology Project. To tell us more about this is Dr. Karen Stoiber, Public Outreach Coordinator at the Saskatchewan Archaeological Society. Karen has been an archaeologist for over 20 years, working across the Canadian Plains and in the United States. She originally did her undergraduate degree at the University of Alberta, hoping to become an Egyptologist or work in the Mediterranean. However, after doing a field school in Plains Archaeology near the town of Bodo, Alberta, she realized that North American archaeology was her passion. Karen came to the University of Saskatchewan to do her master's degree in archaeology and from there decided to continue on and complete her PhD. Karen's position with the SAS means she gets to travel the province, giving talks and learning more about Saskatchewan archaeology. Karen, you can go ahead and start your presentation. Great. Thank you very much, Kim. Can everybody see it right now? You're good. I'm good. Good. Good to know. First time ever presenting through Microsoft Teams, so let's hope it goes well. Um, I would like to acknowledge today that I am talking to you from Treaty 6 territory, homeland of many, many First Nations groups since time immemorial, as well as the Métis Nation. I was born and raised on Treaty 6 two, territory too, as Kim mentioned. So I'm not going to go through a uh, background on myself because it's already been given to you, but let's just say I have a deep and abiding love of Plains archaeology, predominantly with pre-contact archaeology, so before European con colonization. However, working with the SAS has exposed me to a lot more historical archaeology, and I've developed a love for that too as a result. So today I'm going to give you a little bit of a background on what the Saskatchewan Archaeological Society is, our field school programs, and then get right into the meat of our Fort Carleton Archaeology Project. So the SAS is a registered nonprofit charity that receives funding through the Saskatchewan Lotteries Trust Fund that's administered through SAS Culture Incorporated. Our mission is to connect you to Saskatchewan's past and that you have a deep understanding of archaeology, recognize its value and support the preservation of this heritage resource. So we value and respect conservation and preservation, so archaeological stewardship, good governance, indigenous cultures, a unified message, a clear direction, engaged audiences, flexibility, diversity, accessibility, as well as our people. We are beholden to a number of stakeholders, which, which includes roughly 300 members of the society, our chapters, which are regional archaeological groups that are located throughout the province, students, the people of Saskatchewan, interested people outside of the province, the government, other archaeologists, as well as future generations. So as part of our education mandate, we have a specific policy that deals with types of education programs that the SAS should develop and provide opportunities for, one of those being our field schools. Now, we've offered two types of field schools in the past, both an excavation field school and a survey field school. Excavation field schools take place at known archaeological sites around the province, while surveying field schools are a bit more ad hoc and take place at various locations. These type of field schools involve surveying the landscape for archaeological sites and artifacts, and then recording any kind of archaeology that we come across through a Saskatchewan archaeological resource record, which is then submitted to the Heritage Conservation Branch so that they have knowledge that archaeology exists in that specific area. Both of our field schools are for our membership, for students, so primary straight through to post-secondary post students, as well as the public. Our field schools provide employment specifically for university at both an undergraduate and graduate level, and these students tend to staff our summer programs and outreach over a roughly 13 to 15 week period. We also now have an internship program which started in the fall of 2016. 
This is through the Young Canada Works Building Careers and Heritage, and that's money and the internship program is disseminated through the National Trust for Canada or the Canadian Museums Association. It allows us to hire recent graduates for six month terms of employment, and this is paid employment, uh, to work on special projects. So we have a number of special projects, and that could be anything from leading a field school to updating or digitizing our educational resources and our most recent special project, which is our projectile point publication that's going to be coming out this summer. Field schools also provide training for employees, for students, for the public in terms of skills development, so things like GPS and map reading, excavation methodology, field experience, and any kind of general archaeological knowledge. Uh, it also provides professional development seminars. So we've worked with Saskatchewan Provincial Parks in the past to provide a kind of interpretive uh, program introduction to archaeology. So to teach those interpreters how to recognize archaeology or a site or an artifact, what to do when they encounter it, what to tell people, and guests that come to their parks, what they should do as well. And volunteer opportunities, of course, particularly after the excavation or the surveying pro portion of the field schools, more lab opportunities to learn what happens with the artifacts, things like cleaning, cataloging analysis, as well as curations. So how we decide on a field school is really at the request of communities, organizations, or individuals, right? It's it's not hard to pick a site or an area of the province in which to do some kind of excavation or surveying field school. So this is a little bit of what it looks like when it comes to the field school program. We have both the school program and the public program, as I mentioned. So the school program, um, has been running more formally since around 2010. It provides school groups with the experiential learning opportunities that incorporate a wide variety of education subjects. So it covers everything from social studies, as you would expect, to art, mathematics, physical education. It's proven extremely popular with schools throughout the province. And we average around 150 students a year that take part in the program. And that's probably on the low end, considering the amount of students we've had in the past five years or so. The public excavation program has been running officially pretty much since the inception of the society, but became more formalized in the late 1980s with the work at Camp Rainer. So we view these programs as mutually beneficial relationships and that the school groups who attend fulfill some of our core values in educating and introducing the public to Saskatchewan's archaeological heritage and providing an opportunity for students to experience hands-on learning besides just touring a site, right? If you can get your hands dirty, you're going to retain the knowledge and the history of that location more than if you're just looking around reading panels or listening to someone interpret the site history for you. So it allows us to offer the school program to different areas of the province and encountered many different school divisions. So usually schools that are eligible are based on the location in which the site is located. So anything in that particular geographic area. If you can travel to the site, you can usually attend the site. We do an open call for participants in the early spring, and we select schools based on a first come first served uh, basis. We encourage grades four to nine teachers to apply, but we've accepted slightly younger grades in the past, as well as high school students. Uh, the program's best suited for grades four to nine based on the Saskatchewan educational curriculum, but We'll take anyone. If you're willing to learn and get your hands dirty, we're happy to have students come out and join us. So both the school program as well as the public participants, they usually get information ahead of time. The schools, again, is more formalized. Um, we send out information in the form of booklets on what to expect, what you should bring, how an archaeological excavation works, a history of the site in which the students will be working. Again, the public 
uh, gets the same sort of information. The public is also encouraged to read a booklet in advance as well as watch a video uh, that we've put together in the last year on exactly what would be happening at the sites. We also encourage teachers to look at how excavation um, methodology as well as archaeology fits into the educational curriculum through a number of documents that we've come up with that are available on our website as PDFs. So once all this information is given ahead of time, everybody will arrive on site. Um, Usually we have about a 30 minute orientation session when people get to the site, just kind of refresh their memory about what's supposed to happen, what that we expect to find, safety procedures, things of that sort. The school groups tend to be divided into two groups. We call them the hunter group and the digging group. The hunter group goes and they take part in activities such as an atlatl or a spear thrower hunt. And the digger group goes and learns how to excavate. About halfway through the session, we will switch so everyone will get an equal opportunity to try the different activities that are out there. If we have time remaining, we often bring the school group together and we play our, our card game, Trappers and Traders, which is a really great historic fur trade card game that we've developed in the last 10 years. So we divide that field day into a morning and an afternoon session, and that's the same as the public. They also have the opportunity to take part in some activities if they wish, um, but usually people are very excited to actually be diggling in the ground, so they might throw the odd spear at our bison target or not. In 2019, we developed another document that shows how excavations linked to the Saskatchewan curriculum. And this is just an example here on this slide of how some of the subject areas um, fit into the outcomes and indicators that teachers often need to fulfill as part of their learning plans. Okay, so now the, the interesting stuff. Archaeological research project. As I said, the SAS has been involved with research projects in the province since we were founded in 1963. In the early years, it was mostly in collaboration with organizations such as the Royal Saskatchewan Museum at sites like Kyle Mammoth, uh, later on Chimney Coulee. A lot of research projects through the University of Saskatchewan. This is either student or professor led research project that the SAS has helped on. We've also been involved with national organizations such as Parks Canada. Um, Batoche in 2001 with the slumping of the riverbank was impacting some of the rifle pits at the site, as well as Farwell's post at Fort Walsh. So we've we've had a number of different opportunities to be all over the province. Um, more recently, we've started to partner with consulting companies such as Stantec and Western Heritage to um, help out and provide public and school opportunities at sites that they're working on. In terms of SAS-led research projects, we've had quite a number, including Camp Rainer near Lake Diefenbaker, Lemsford Ferry surveying Little Manitou around the Watrous region, St. Victor Petroglyphs, Tramping Lake Area Survey, South Branch House, which Mike is very familiar with, uh, Herschel and Plenty Area Site Recording, the Far Site, which is near the town of Ogama, way down in the south, and then most recently, Fort Carlton. So I'm going to briefly go over the most recent projects we've done. So South Branch House was an initiative between us, SAS Parks, and One Arrow First Nation. The site is located north of Batalash National Historic Site along the South Saskatchewan River, and it's kind of hidden out of the way, so it was subject to both vandalism and damage, being intentional and erosional damage. Uh, it underwent excavations to reveal structures and determine if it was either a Hudson's Bay Company or a Northwest Company post, as well as to conform historic records of a 1794 fire. The project resulted in seven years of formalized excavation, although there were researchers doing a little bit of uh, archival research, historical research, and some testing prior to the actual program beginning in 2007. 
Throughout the seven years, over 22 different school groups from Saskatoon to PA and in between came out to the site. So over a thousand students, over 250 members of the public. It employed 24 students as site supervisors and project leads during that time and resulted in two Master of Arts theses from the U of S, Mike's being one of them. So what did they find? Anything you can imagine, historic. Metal, nails, buttons, beads, pipes, metal trade points, um, all sorts of really, really great artifacts came out of the site and provided a wonderful opportunity to learn more about the late uh, 1700s in Saskatchewan. The FAR site was an initiative between us and one of our longtime and founding members, Byron Ebel. The site's located in a cultivated field on a hill slope near the town of Ogama. So obviously subject to damage through cultivation and erosion. Byron had been collecting artifacts off the surface so that they wouldn't be further damaged by plow blades for 40 odd years. He was convinced that portions of the site were still intact beneath the plow zone. So we agreed to go out there and throw in some excavation units to determine the site integrity as well as its extent and if we could lock down a firm age range for the site. This project resulted in three years of excavation plus an additional year helping a master's student. We had three schools out of over 120 students, 38 members of the public. We also uh, had a group from the Regina Open Door Society come out for a day to learn about Saskatchewan archaeology. We employed 11 students through the process of the project and it will result in one Master of Arts thesis. She's almost done. So we did determine that the site is intact beneath the plow zone, although cultivation has damaged large portions of it, as has rodent activity. And as of right now, it is the oldest intact site in the province, dating in and around 10,000 years old. Humboldt, again, a project between us, Western Heritage and the Humboldt and District Museum and Gallery. Our excavations there was working with Western Heritage to determine telegraph station location based on GPR results that they did at the original Humboldt site. This would add to fully figuring out if these GPR anomalies were the original telegraph station and add to the overall interpretation of the larger original Humboldt site. This resulted in three years of excavation, five different school groups coming out from the city of Humboldt. So over 580 students, 200 members of the public, and it employed seven students. The project ended in 2019. We were considering going back until tw in 2020, but everybody knows what happened in 2020. That pretty much kiboshed any field work for the next few years. All right, for Carlton. In 2021, we began excavations with the University of Saskatchewan on site. So there had been archaeology done at the site in the past that led to uh, the provincial park being established, the reconstruction of the fort itself. Uh, a lot of that archaeological fieldwork was done in the 1960s and the 1970s. Mike mentioned that he was out there doing some GPR surveying for some tourism development in the area. As you can see from the map on the bottom here, uh, we were out there about the same time as Mike and his team. Uh, he nicely let some of the university field school students help with the shovel tests that he was putting on. He worked to the south and the east of the reconstructed fort, and we worked to the west of the reconstructed fort. So in a different area, trying to figure out what was in that area. One of the most important things was the involvement of Indigenous communities from the local area. So we started our first year by involving Beardies and Okamasis Cree Nation. Um, the Parks has a really great relationship with them. So they were happy to come out and they had a pipe ceremony with the university students, with Adel Heritage employees, with us and park staff as well. 
and it was fantastic. And we were told that this was the first pipe ceremony held between Indigenous and non-Indigenous groups at the fort since the signing of Treaty 6 in 1876. So pretty, pretty touching moment being out there. This is a planned three-year project. Originally, it was just between parks and the SAS. However, the university was looking for a location in which to have a field school. So they approached us in late 2020 um, and asked, hey, can, can we join up, you know, and we'll get students out there and teach them what to do. So we did have a university field school in May and June of last year. We also had a very small public excavation field school in July and August with 21 members of the public. And we managed to employ seven students just throughout that four month period. Right now, there are two Master of Arts theses starting on this project and there definitely could be more. So this is a really bad map of our unit locations west of the reconstructed fort. The first year was mostly an exploratory year, just trying to figure out what's there. We had no idea which phase of the fort this could be. Uh, historical records tell us that Fort Carlton went through about five building phases. So the uh, reconstructed fort is the fifth building phase, the last, the most latest one until it burnt down into 1885. And that's over top of some of those 1885 uh, buildings. Where we were to the west, we're not entirely sure what building phase we're in. So that's, that's part of our overall uh, research program objectives is to figure out what phase of the fort are we in? Is it the fort? Is it something completely different? Can we establish site boundaries? Um, has the, f the site been affected by things like cultivation and other earth movement? And we want to interpret the site within a context of the operations of a fur trade post. And of course, to provide a experiential learning opportunity for the public, for park visitors, for students as well. So there was no school program because of the pandemic last year and a very, very truncated public uh, component, not only due to health directives, but also because we had such wild weather in July that we got smoked out uh, during our July field school. There was just, you couldn't breathe, too smoky in the air. So now to take you through the 2021 field season, working with the university students, learning how to do archeology span for the first time. They've had classes, but not all have had field experience. So they're taught how to survey, how to use non-invasive testing techniques like GPR, um, metal detecting, using a total station. Uh, this was done with Dr. Terry Clark from the University of Saskatchewan, brought his team and equipment out to do that as well. So how to excavate with shovels, with trowels, how to talk to the public. Since that, that is a big facet of archeology span is public outreach getting people interested and getting them to care about the history that's literally beneath our feet. Students were provided with classroom instructions. Sask Parks was great. They allowed us the use of one of the barracks that's in within the reconstructed fort, not only to have a field lab and field classroom, but to store all of our equipment there. So students had classes in how to identify historic archaeology artifacts, how to interpret them, how to dig properly. They got overviews on the history of the site and fur trade history in general. They got to do all aspects of excavation from surveying to bailing out their units when it filled with rainwater um, to filling in the units at the end of the year so that they are preserved when we come back the following year. These are some of the artifacts that's come out of the 2021 field season. So a lot of metal objects, anything from adornments, so buttons, suspender buckles, uh, brackets, a, a metal cross maybe off of a rosary, beads, both Venetian glass and seed beads, pipe fragments, bone beads, musket balls and shell casings, glass, tinkle cones. Uh, we have metal 
uh, projectile points, as you can see on the bottom there, and glass medicine bottles, such as this essence of peppermint on the left side of your screen. One of uh, the field school students and later one of our summer employees, Sarah Pucha Tate, actually analyzed all 602 ceramic shards that came out. Um, majority of the ceramics are Spode Copeland, again, dating to that 19th century period. I've got six of them on the screen here uh, that you can see. Um, of the ceramics, not all could be identified because they were either missing decoration on them or they were just too small of a piece. We also have Port Neuf uh, ceramics, spatterware pattern in particular that are coming out of the site. Again, these very, very common ceramic types that date to the 1800s. So it fits right in with the Fort timeline. Perhaps the best thing from the Fort Carlton excavation was the amount of organic materials that we were able to recover. Uh, wood uh, in the form of just chunks of wood to posts of some sort, uh, maybe a compressed wood floor, a barrel as you see in the center here that we removed intact and it's awaiting analysis, leather in the form of shoe soles and a leather bag and copious amounts of birch bark, tiny little bits, rolls, bags and a bowl as well. And you can see on these top two pictures on the left, the stitching that's actually on the bags. So a lot of this artifactual material will end up on display at Fort Carlton and aid in their uh, interpretive center displays on the site. Of the 24,000 plus artifacts, a lot of faunal remains, as would be expected. So we've got bison bones, a cow skull, bird bones, a lot of rodents. The gophers are very happy on that site. At this point of the project, we're unsure, as I said, what phase and date of the site is being excavated. That's our, our future, future problem to solve. So in conclusion, the SAS field programs provide multiple opportunities and experiences, not only for students and members of the public, but for our project staff and our members as well. Having an active archaeological investigation at a site such as Fort Carlton helps promote the history of the area and encourage visitors to the park. It provides training opportunities for university students and new experiences for primary and secondary school students with the hope of creating future archaeologists. For the public, SAS field schools showcase the rich and extensive human history in the province and the importance of archaeological resources. And I'll just put up some of our contact information there. So we are currently planning 2022. Public field school dates and registration should be available soon. And Parks is taking charge of organizing the school program for us. So more information to come if you want to know more, definitely feel free to contact us. All right, thank you, Karen, for your presentation and telling us about the Fort Carlton project and the opportunities for people to participate in public field schools. I uh, will now open it up for questions, but we don't have very much time because they, you guys took up all your time, which is good, <laughs> with lots of information. I will mention in the chat, there were some questions from Vince and Rick and Donna about the cost of GPR machines and the cost of doing surveys. Mark, or Mark, Mike has answered your some of those questions and he also provided his email. So if anybody wants to contact Mike about any of those questions about costs, please do so. Um, if you don't see his email, you can contact myself and I can hook you up with him as well. Um, there is a question from we'll start with one question in here uh, mike what's the degree of confidence one can say a gpr anomaly is a grave um, i assume confidence rises when in an area where the existence of graves is known or suspected yeah that's a good question um it really depends on um we where you are working um if you are looking for graves you know in a in a specific area um the degree of confidence uh, it, it really de it depends on again um the the site area the location soil types and 
um, again, experience, I feel. Um, I think in a lot of cases, uh, we are often quick to um, report graves, um, but I, of course, without further verification, I mean, we, we don't know 100%, um, but with experience and if GPR surveys are done right, um, especially with tight transects and interpreting the data correctly, which is crucial, I think you do definitely have an 85 to 90% uh, accuracy of, of confidence, what I would say. And of course, uh, one thing too, and GPR surveys um, in marked or a cemetery and stuff might not always detect all graves, especially if if uh, and in, especially early graves if uh, wood has rotted away and or the body has really decayed and the soil has settled. Um, so you might not capture a hundred percent of all unmarked graves within a cemetery, specifically as well. All right, does anybody have any further questions? You can speak up or raise your hand or put in the chat. We got a lot of thank you for the presentations and they were great comments. I don't see any further questions. Um, with that, because we are at time, um, I guess I'll close it up. And if you have any other questions, you can definitely reach out to any of the presenters or, oh, somebody's asking, will there be additional opportunities at Fort Carlton? I think you kind of answered that, but you can answer it again, Karen. We're definitely hoping to run the school program this year as well as the public program. And we actually want to have uh, some more of the Indigenous communities in the local area to come out. So uh, if, if you're a member of any of those communities, please contact me um, so we can we can involve you in the project as well. OK. So with that, that's the conclusion of today's webinar. Thank you to all of our presenters and to our guests. Videos of all the webinars will be available on our website in the near future. And on behalf of Marvin, myself, and the Heritage Conservation Branch, we hope you all enjoyed this year's Heritage Webinar Series. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.